be talking about getting started with spring grazing and some considerations you need to take account of before you turn your livestock into the pasture this spring. My guest today is Garth Ruff. Garth is the Extension Beef Cattle Field Specialist and he works here in Noble County as well. This is Garth's first time on Forage Focus and probably one of many more to come. Garth, thank you for joining me today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Christine. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, I've been in this role since last fall. Uh, you know, as a beef cattle field specialist, previously in Northwest Ohio as a county extension educator. Uh, backgrounds in animal science, uh, beef cattle production. Uh, and I'm certainly glad to be back here in cow country and at the Eastern Ag Research Station today. What are some of the things you're hoping to accomplish in your program as we move forward? Yeah, you know, I, hopefully once we get back to some semblance normal, I think we did have, we had a pretty successful winter virtual meeting season this go around. Uh, but really to get out and meet the beef producers across the state, uh, you know, an interest of mine as we talk about cow-calf production is taking a hard look at economics uh, and what how we can implement changes on the farm uh, to improve profitability of the cow-calf operation. Whether you're a beef, sheep, goat producer, we have some spring grazing tips for you today. And Garth, pretty soon our pastures are gonna be greening up. People are probably thinking about getting their spring grazing rotations in line. Uh, but everybody needs to be patient still for a little bit longer. We're only at the middle of March at this point and uh, we're not really in the peak growth season for our forages yet. Yeah, certainly, you know, as we come out of, out of winter, we certainly had some snow this winter. We had a shorter muddy season uh, than, than average, at least here in recent memory. Uh, so things are really starting to look green, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our forages have come out of dormancy and are ready to be grazed. That's right. Our temperatures uh, in within the soil are still pretty cool, and we're not going to see a lot of growth from our uh, cool season forages until our soil temps get up a little warmer. What we want as far as air temperatures for most of the forages we grow here in Ohio is uh, between 55 and 75 degrees is where they're going to grow um, best. We are starting to see things germinate and start to green up, uh, but we still need to give these plants time to actually emerge and put on some growth before we begin grazing. There are some concerns both for plant health and animal health if we start grazing too early and if the conditions are right in the sweet spot for grass tetany, Garth, what is grass tetany and how concerned do we need to be about it? Yeah, here in Ohio, you know, we talk is about grass tetany uh, as something we want to avoid. Uh, it's typically due to a lack of magnesium, either in the forage or in the animal, uh, but can certainly be complicated along with high potassium levels in addition to that lack of magnesium. So, you know, we're mid-March uh, today as we, as we record this, you know, as we talk with beef cattle producers, certainly need to think about feeding a high magnesium mineral, uh, you know, during this time of rapid forage growth. And the reason that the magnesium levels in the forage are low goes back to that cool temperatures in the soil. When the temperatures are still cool, the plants aren't taking up as much magnesium as normal when the growing conditions are ideal. So a lack of magnesium in the forage can quickly turn into a lack of magnesium for the animal and that's how that relationship moves forward. But it, it's also tied in with potassium as you mentioned and a lot of the potassium in our pastures come from, comes from the deposition of urine. So we, we have an issue in early spring with the balance of all of our nutrients and and how concentrated they are in the forage. Have you ever actually seen any issues with grass tetany in your time yet? Yeah, I've never actually seen grass tetany. Uh, you know, you hear stories about it, and some of our colleagues that are a little more seasoned talk about uh, grass tetany uh, as a concern, you know, but I think the key there is having a good, balanced mineral program and not just feeding minerals during this time of rapid forage growth and growth in the spring, but you know, utilizing a well-balanced mineral year-round uh, 
and, and taking care of that part of the nutrition and, and the providing a balanced diet. You know, that's where, you know, maybe there's room to improve in terms of testing our forages uh, as far as pasture goes, and even soil testing. Uh, you know, we know that pH uh, has a capability to limit the availability of nutrients, not only to those forages, but then on up into the animal. Absolutely, and we should be frequently testing our soils at least every three years if we're not seeing dramatic changes in our management systems. Soil sampling on a three-year basis is something we would typically recommend, but if you're making a major change, you should always soil test at those change points too. If you're planning to plant a new crop or you've secured some new ground you haven't farmed previously, do a soil test so you know where to start. The basis of all plant growth is soils and anything that eats plants as a way to grow is going to depend on your soil health as well. So take the time to get your soils tested. Now is a great time, but you can soil test anytime really. But for moving into the to the future, it's ideal if you soil sample about the same time each year because nutrient availability changes with the seasons. So if you choose spring, continue to sample in the spring. If you choose fall, sample in the fall. And then uh, we would recommend that you use the tri-state fertilizer recommendations to do your applications. Those are readily available online or you can also consult your county extension educator for assistance interpreting and implementing your uh, soil fertility program. Garth, you mentioned making sure that feeding a good diet and adequate mineral supplementation throughout the entire year is important, but if our people are going to pursue those high mag minerals as part of their management program, and we think they should, when is the ideal time to start feeding those, and when could you go back to your normal mineral? Yeah, a real timely conversation. You know, as we talk about forages greening up, you know, now's probably the time to you know, get that high mag mineral ordered uh, and get it out in front of your cow herd, uh, you know, and then feed that throughout the rest of the spring. Um, then as we approach, you know, kind of that summer slump and our forages aren't as green, um, you know, I know there's a lot of people that feed the high mag mineral year round and that's all right. Uh, but if you choose to rotate uh, your mineral sources based on forage testing, especially we can have some variability and some products, as long as they're high quality in terms of bioavailability throughout the year. Something else we might want to consider is an addition to our mineral program is the addition of an insect growth regulator to help with fly control. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, as we talk to beef producers, especially here in eastern and southeast Ohio, pink eye has probably been one of the number one problems plaguing the cow herds. So anything we can do to help prevent pink eye, and in this case, insect growth regulators or some sort of larvicide in that mineral program. About the same window we would feed our high mag mineral, we want to control that first generation of flies. And once we control that first generation, the subsequent generations tend to be smaller, and uh, pink eye just becomes increasingly more hard to treat. Yeah, I agree. Prevention is absolutely key, as it is with all diseases. but. As we continue to talk with producers about pink eye, it's important to start well early in the season so your issues don't compound over time. So Garth, as we look now more at the forages that surround us, we've got quite a bit of brown material here with us. This is uh, mostly tall fescue that we're standing on. There's some green peeking out. We have a lot of the senesce tissue from the previous season, but if you look behind us, it looks quite a bit more green. Now, do you think color You know, we get excited when we see that green in the springtime of the year, uh, but really we need to consider forage height and dry matter availability uh, before we turn our cows out to grass or before we buy those stalker calves uh, and make that pasture available to them. Uh, something that we're noticing too is there's quite a few areas that are pretty green and quite a few areas that are pretty brown and we've actually been pretty dry here for a few weeks. And as we get some more rainfall, we'll see green up start a little quicker too. We actually need to pay attention though to how much mass, how much green matter is really growing there so that our animals will have enough to eat when we turn them out and also so that our plants will recover. Garth, you're holding something that's a pretty helpful tool for that very task. What do you have in your hands? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, what we call pasture stick. 
Um, and these particular ones were produced by a uh, combination of Ohio State, our local soil and waters, and the uh, USDA. What we can do with this stick is estimate available dry matter. It's maybe not as precise as tools taking samples and, and drying them and those kind of things, but it's a good enough tool that gives us an idea how much dry matter we have. So what we can do is measure the height of the forage with the ruler here but to get a better dry it, better estimate of dry matter. We can take the stick, shove it within the sward of forage, and then you can see how many of those dots are visible. If we stand above the stick and for different mixes of different forage species, and depending on the number of the dots we see, that's going to give us an idea of dry matter availability. Garth, I see nine dots on that stick from where I'm standing. What does that mean? So if we see three or more, that's kind of our scale, zero to one, one to two, three, three and more. And this is what I would consider basically a tall fescue stand. That's only 150 to 200 pounds of available dry matter. Per inch. How many inches do you have here? Yeah, at this point, uh, as we look at the green forage, it's relatively short. I'd say two inches. Yeah, so that's uh, between 350 to 400 pounds. Yeah, it's probably still early to effectively graze. Uh, and not only to manage the forage, but to manage the rotation through our paddocks uh, in an efficient manner in terms of forage utilization. When growth picks up, it is going to pick up fast, and that does go back to the types of forages we typically use here in Ohio. Most of our go-to forages in pastures or hay fields are cool season plants, and like I mentioned earlier, that means they're going to put on most of their growth when the temperature is between 55 and 75 degrees. And what that translates for us here in Ohio is typically from April to the end of May, we're going to see a huge flush of growth, and then things will start to slow down. We'll hit that summer slump where production is pretty low, and then we'll pick up again in the fall as temperatures cool once again. So when that growth is happening rapidly, we have multiple concerns from soil fertility aspects, but also how quickly we need to move the animals. And it can sometimes be more difficult to put enough pressure on the grass in the springtime. We talk about over and under grazing quite a bit, and in the springtime, uh, which are we more concerned with about, let's say here in March versus a couple months from now, mid-April, mid-May? Yeah, so here in March, you know, we just use our forage stick and we've only got about two inches of new forage growth. So if we turn out too early, then we have the potential to overgraze those paddocks and really um, slow that growth uh, here coming in, into the spring. Now, once we get to the point mid-April, early May, where we have rapid forage growth, um, you know, then there's the potential to undergraze. You know, we want to make sure we harvest enough of that forage, um, you know, to, to be efficient in terms of forage utilization. Um, you, you know, and if you're on the fence as to whether those cattle or sheep or goats, whatever it might be, need to be rotated, you know, I think our recommendations usually go ahead and rotate them. Uh, but certainly undergrazing, there's a greater potential for that during that rapid uh, forage growth that's they'll be here not too long from now. Absolutely and if we think on the hay production side of things um, a lot of times we find ourselves with conditions that are too wet to run the hay equipment through when it's ideal to get first cutting. Something that we've talked about at various programs is grazing your first cutting instead of mechanically harvesting it. What are your thoughts on that in regard to beef cattle or other animals? I think we've got to consider a couple things. You know, how much store forage do you need to get through the winter? That's probably going to tell us uh, whether that's an option. We need the first cutting hay to get our beef cows, uh, especially spring calving cows, or if we have cows that calve during the winter. So how much store forage do we need to get? Uh, and then, you know, I think soil conditions are key, especially right now. Uh, if it's an approved seeding, seeding has got some legumes, uh, we don't want to trample that too much. So maybe it's the opposite. You know, we harvest that first cutting hay that we didn't have the opportunity to graze and stockpile those fescue hay fields going into the winter. Yeah, those are all good points. I think um, something too that catches people's attention this time of year as they're knowing they should soil test, looking at their fertility adjustments that need made, um, everybody knows that grass needs nitrogen to be really successful. So 
why wouldn't we put nitrogen on right now? And so early, uh, you know, it, in the mid spring when our for, forage comes out of dormancy, especially our cool season grasses, we've already got that rapid growth occurring. Um, so we don't want to undergraze. We don't want to have too much forage or too much dry matter for the amount of um, animal units we would have. So we don't want to outpace our livestock in terms of forage growth with the excessive nitrogen. Um, then early in the season, you know, our forages are pretty efficient, right? Uh, in terms of nutrient uptake. Uh, so maybe in the spring, we look at reduced nitrogen fertilization. Uh, certainly a good time to consider things such as phosphorus and potash, um, you know, especially on, on those hay fields. Absolutely. And in regard to lime, um, you can choose to apply lime in the spring or the fall. Either way, it will be effective. But lime takes time to actually have an effect on pH. So as soon as you discover you need some lime, it's a good idea to start uh, actively adjusting as you can because it'll take six months probably to see a response from the application you've made. Um, but as we mentioned already, lime is key in access to nutrients that are already present in your soil. So if your pH isn't on target, you're missing the opportunity to use nutrients you already have. If you're realizing that it's been a little while since you've done a soil test and maybe it's something you should pursue, you're wondering about the pH of your soils, there are some indicators out there that you can see with your eyes that may tell you if you need lime or not. And what we're talking about is weeds. Yeah, yeah, I think lime tends to be kind of that forgotten nutrient in a lot of cases, uh, yeah, especially if we have some of those acidic soils um, in eastern and southern Ohio. And a great indicator of soil pH oftentimes are weeds. You know, we think about things like multiflora rose, uh, tend to prefer a little bit more acidic soil. Uh, and then on our farm at home, we use ironweed as a pretty good example. You know, in, in the pastures that have more ironweed, they tend to be uh, tall ironweed, tend to have, be a little lower in pH. One that I see a lot as an indicator is broom sedge. That tends to hang around, give some winter interest to the landscape. Um, but when everything else is dead and you still have that broom sedge sticking up in the pasture, that may be an indication that your pH is a bit too low. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I know some of the old timers refer to that broom sedge as poverty grass. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of cases, they're talking about poor soil fertility uh, when we have those excellent broom sedge stands there in the fall and the winter. Now, we've recently looked and fertilizer's pretty pricey right now. So before you go out and just buy some, look at the recommendations and consider doing split applications if that's ideal that can help you split out the cost over an extended period of time and also provide the right amount of nutrients at the right time when we say split application and we're talking about pastures or hay systems it's ideal to follow up after you've done that first grazing cycle or first cutting hay and follow up with some nutrient application if you can um, and then also look at it going into the fall as well what does that provide us in terms of forage quality and vigor? Yeah, so as we think about fertilizing forages, we really got three time windows. Um, you know, here early, kind of mid-March, um, is a good time to do a split application. You know, that reduced rate of nitrogen, uh, you know, fertilize for phosphorus and potassium based on soil test. Uh, then another time where we can look at maybe a little more nitrogen or that split application of P and K is, you know, kind of that mid-June, mid-July, we got first cutting hay off, uh, our initial grazing cycles uh, done with, and that time of fertilization is going to help uh, in, re in improving what we call that summer slump, you know, where our cool season grasses kind of take a break. Uh, get a little bit lazy on us. Now we got to have some rain to make that work, um, but it, that's an option as well. And then our third option, uh, you know, especially in our fescue-based pastures or hay fields, is you know go in with about 50 pounds of nitrogen, 100 pounds of urea uh, around the first of August, and then stockpile that forage uh, into the winter months. Absolutely, and we can see the differences between areas that we've designated as. Uh, stockpile forages. This could be an example what we're standing on right now versus more of an area we could call a sacrifice lot where we know 
we're going to be repeatedly feeding livestock. They're going to spend a lot of time there, and we're anticipating that it's going to be pretty rough come springtime, often have a lot of mud, uh, and it's going to take some pretty intense rehabilitation to get that back to what we call a pasture again. Any tips for producers as they're thinking about moving livestock out of those areas on ways that they can be improved? Yeah, so as, as we think about improving those sacrifice paddocks, uh, you know, it's something that we do every year uh, where we feed our round bales during the winter, go ahead and clean up some of that mud, some of that manure. Uh, there's kind of a concentration of nutrients around that hay bale feeder. Go ahead and distribute those uh, across the field, usually with manure spreader. Uh, and then come in there and you know just kind of walk on some forages that are going to be quick to establish um, and then keep the cattle out of there for a while you know while you're going through that grazing rotation through your paddocks that have rapid growing forages you know you shouldn't have to revisit that sacrifice paddock get it remediated to a point um, you know and then it's almost kind of a continuous cycle you know unfortunately we get it remediated we tear it up again. Uh, we get some forages growing and, you know, it's winter and we got to feed hay somewhere, right? Right. Um, but yeah, they, they distribute those nutrients, try to get some forages growing during the summer um, and try not to tear it up too bad. Of course, mother nature and uh, mud have their way. Have something to say about it. Absolutely. Whether you're rehabbing one of those sacrifice lots or looking to plant something new this coming season, Remember, it's important to be patient. Our wait time between planting, germinating, and actually grazing that stand of forage is typically going to be about 60 days. That's two months that we need to keep animals off of that area. So if you're considering replanting, I would suggest going in smaller segments so that you don't run out of pasture when you need it. You have to factor in that wait time. If we graze too early, we're hurting the root systems of those plants. Likely we're going to run into issues with nutrient uptake, competition with other plants in the system, whether they're weeds or less desirable forages. And all in all, that's going to lead to decreased growth. And we're going to get to the end of the season wondering why I even bothered to do that. I'm just in the same spot I was before. So patience is key both in getting ready for spring grazing, establishing new forage, and rehabbing those troubled areas from the winter. Uh, so you talk about being patient, especially after new seeding, uh, you know, and we've actually had some weather to do some, you know, I've seen some oats planted here in southeast Ohio and, you know, maybe some grass seedings already go in. Uh, on seedings where we've disturbed some soil, is there any benefit to mowing that paddock first before we turn out to graze it? Yeah, I think there are some benefits to mowing before our first turnout, and, and that can just even be the ability to take seed heads off the plants. We want those plants to get well established, but remember that once they enter that reproductive phase, which could happen in that 60 day window, they're gonna have decreased forage value for our livestock. So one, we can improve quality by knocking those seed heads off. And two, we may have the ability to smooth out some of those rough patches we have, but with an even distribution of pressure across the field. The defoliation of those plants, that actually sends a hormone response to the plant that triggers new growth. So we're going to get a second flush of both root growth and then above ground tissue growth too and create a stronger system as we move forward into the rest of the season. Some of the other tasks that you can accomplish here in early spring include checking to make sure that all your systems are operating, that your fences are in good working order, same for your waterers. Um, also think about placement of things like waterers and mineral feeders and uh, how far the animals are going to travel to get from one end of the pasture to the other so that we can avoid congregating in the same space for too long. While you're doing those tasks, take along your forage stick too so that you can monitor plant growth over time. Typically, I tell people to wait until forages are about eight inches or more uh, before turning animals in to graze. And what are some other things that people can do right now, Garth, as they're getting ready to start the grazing season? Yeah, you know, I kind of have that pre-grazing checklist, so to speak, you know, of course, you talk touched on forage height there, making sure there's enough forage uh, before we turn out. You know, but it, it's things like checking water gates, uh, cleaning out spring tanks, you know, inevitably you get leaves and uh, decaying matter in the bottom of those spring tanks. 
uh, take a shovel with you, clean those out. Um, you know, walk your fence lines, checking insulators, um, making sure if you got an electric fence that you got a good current uh, and no shorts anywhere. You know, it's amazing what happens during the winter when we kind of uh, forget about those things. Uh, you know, and, and then before you know it, we'll be talking about weed control and fence lines, uh, controlling those annual uh, annual weeds that inevitably grow. Uh, they, they're opportun opportunist. Uh, you, you know, where the cattle or uh, livestock aren't grazing, uh, that's where they like to grow. So we'll be thinking about that before too long. Yeah, we will. And we'll come back to cover those topics in our next editions of Forage Focus. We hope you'll join us in the months to come. Garth, thank you for being on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you and looking forward to lots more developments from our beef programming efforts. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.